Hi, my name is Johnny and I'll be taking you through the EEG from signal formation to its clinical applications in helping us understand epilepsy. So the first question you might ask is, what is an EEG? EEG stands for electroencephalogram, which as you can see means electrical brain picture, or in other words, mapping out the electrical activity in the brain. So how are we going to do that? Well first, I'll go over exactly what we're trying to measure, followed by what we're going to use to measure it. Here's Bob, badly drawn stick man. If we cut open Bob's skull and take a slice through his brain, we can look for the source of the electrical activity. In the cerebral cortex, there are specialized neurons called apical pyramidal cells. Some of them are relatively large and arranged parallel to each other, perpendicular to the surface of the brain. When action potentials propagate along neurons, local currents are produced outside of the cell which facilitate propagation of the signal along the neuron. However, these currents are too small to be detected by EEG, and the axons are arranged randomly, so many of the currents cancel each other out. But there are other sources of current in neurons. At the synapse between two neurons, neurotransmitter moves across the synaptic cleft and binds to the postsynaptic membrane. This causes ion channels to open in the membrane and positively charged ions flow into the cell. With the positive ions rushing into the cell, the extracellular space around the neuron becomes negatively charged. This is shown in orange on the diagram and is referred to as the sink. In a distant part of the neuron, the ions eventually leave the cell, and this outward flow of positive ions leaves the extracellular space positively charged. This is shown in blue on the diagram and is referred to as the source. The combination of these two related processes clearly forms an electrical dipole between different parts of the neuron. However, the dipole from a single neuron is very small and there is a thick skull as well as other layers of soft tissue to pass through, so individually they are undetectable. Luckily, as mentioned earlier, there are so many pyramidal cells in this layer of the brain, all aligned parallel to each other, and often many of these cells are stimulated at the same time. Therefore, the individually small dipoles summate to form a dipole which is detectable outside the head. As we, from, as we can see from the diagram, if we place electrodes on the surface of the scalp, there is a deflection in the voltage signal compared to a reference. So we know what we're measuring. How do we detect the signals? Seeing as we're trying to record an electrical signal, it makes sense to use electrodes. The electrodes are placed on the scalp at very specific locations. This diagram shows the 1020 system of electrode placement. The numbers refer to the distance from certain reference points on the head to ensure the placement is consistent across different studies. And this is what it looks like when all the electrodes are in place. So now we've got all the electrodes in place, we need to start collecting signals. The problem is, what do we compare them to? The most obvious way would be to use an arbitrary common reference. The electrode signal is fed into a differential amplifier with a reference electrode common to each EEG signal. This technique is useful in that it should reveal the true nature and amplitude of the signal. However, in reality, the reference is often active, and the distance between the electrodes can allow interference to obscure the signal. Another approach is to use bipolar electrodes. For this method, each electrode is connected to an amplifier with the adjacent electrode. This method allows much more accurate localization of the signal. However, it also distorts the true signal and potentially permits signals of opposing phase to cancel each other out and be lost. A third and final approach, which is commonly used, is an average reference. Each electrode is passed into an amplifier along with a signal which is an average of all the electrodes currently being measured. This has the benefit of providing an almost constant reference signal, thus allowing us to measure the amplitude of the signal as well as negating much of the interference. So here's an example of an EEG trace. Each line represents the difference between that electrode and the average of all the electrodes being measured. Now, as you can probably guess, this trace isn't ideal. These sharp peaks are indicative of epileptic events. And this moves us on to the clinically important question, which is, what does the EEG show? When looking at the EEG trace, there are generally a few different types of waves characterized by their frequency. Alpha waves typically have a frequency of 8 to 13 hertz, and are seen in adults at rest with eyes closed and relaxed. Beta waves are higher frequency. 
and they are seen commonly in alert, awake adults. Theta waves are lower frequency and are abnormal in adults who are awake, but normal during sleep and in children. Delta waves are very low frequency, less than 4 Hz, and are only normal in deep sleep and in young babies. But the most striking types of waveforms are those seen in epilepsy. Epilepsy is a neurological condition defined by a sudden recurrent episodes of sensory disturbance or convulsion. These events are usually linked with abnormal electrical activity in the brain, and the most common use of the EEG is in the diagnosis of epilepsy. As you can see, there is a distinct type of wave here, known as spike and wave, which is not seen in healthy patients. Now, the examples here are shown clearly for illustration purposes. In reality, interpreting an EEG is a skill which takes many years to perfect. Thank you for listening.